a Puritan writer named Charles Bridges wrote a commentary on the book of Proverbs. He also wrote a commentary on Psalm 119. I would uh, urge that you might want to read both of those. The book of Proverbs, of course, is filled with godly wisdom. And uh, I have for quite some time practiced reading through Charles Bridges' commentary on Proverbs on a regular basis as part of my devotions. I'm going to share some words to begin our sermon this morning, written by Charles Bridges. Please listen very carefully. Either the child's will or the parent's heart must be broken. That is an astounding statement. Let me read that again. Either the child's will or the parent's heart must be broken. Without a wise and firm control, the parent is miserable and the child is ruined. I want you to open your Bibles to Proverbs 3, verse 12. For whom the Lord loves, he reproves. Another translation is he chastens. Even as a father, the son in whom he delights. Do you get the picture? A father who loves, a father who delights in his son will discipline him as an evidence of that love. A parent who does not and will not discipline his children doesn't love them. Not as they ought to be loved. Why does God discipline us, his children? Because he loves us. And that ought to be the motivating factor in a parent's discipline, his child. Because he loves him and he wants God's best for that child. Now we can follow this line of truth concerning discipline of children. It ought to be done out of a context and motivation of love for the child, not because you're angry and put out by his misconduct. That child is growing up. He's in a process of growth and development. And 
And when he's not, when he's allowed to get, quote, get by with this and that and something else, he's learning that if I play my cards right, I can get my way. And that grows in that child's concept of life, and he begins to think, yeah, no, I can have what I want. I can do what I want. And by the time that reaches teenage years, you got a real problem on your hand. I know. I've, I've been a probation officer. I had 130 boys on my caseload. Interestingly enough, because I could speak Spanish, I ended up being assigned to any Mexican boy that got in trouble in Dallas County was mine. I enjoyed every minute of it, working with those kids. But a lot of it, and the reason why they were there was due to a sheer lack of discipline in the home as they were growing and developing. And by the time they reached their teenage years, patterns of misbehavior, misconduct, selfishness, worldliness, whatever, had begun to take a hold and grip that child's life. into a life of lawlessness, of disobeying God's law and disobeying man's law. And how did that happen? Because they were neglected. No one put any controls or any limitations on their life. And that is an evidence of not being loved. When I took over being superintendent at the boys' home in Hutchins, there were 75 boys there, ages 10 to 17. One of the older boys had been there long enough and had earned his credit to be sent home. I called him in my office. I said, Alex, I want to share, tell you that you have completed the course, you've done well, we feel, we feel like you can go home. And he looked me right in the eye and he said, I don't want to go home. He said, Mr. Walters, I don't have a home to go to. If I go back home, I'll just get in more trouble. And I said, Alex, you can stay here until you feel like you're ready to go home. And he took a sigh of relief. And he was one of my older boys in the older boys' dorm. This may be of some interest. Not so long after that, A part-time night watchman showed up drunk. The boys told me that he'd been drinking. So I went and found him and got him in my office. And I said, I believe you've had a little too much. He looked at me and said, I just had one. 
I says, well, my friend, for you, one's too many. So I said, um, you don't have a job here anymore. He said, who's going to be the night watchman tonight? I said, you're looking at him. And so that night, I was the night watchman. And the next night, and the next night. And then the idea struck me. Why don't I hire Alex, Alex to be my part-time night watchman? He knows the boys better than anybody else. He has a really good idea of what's going to, how things are going. So I met with the commissioner's court and presented the idea to them and asked for permission to do that. They said, Les, if you think he can handle the job and it's a good thing to do, go with it. And he became my part-time night watchman. And from that he began driving the pickup truck into Hutchins to pick up supplies and run errands for us. But he was living in a controlled, disciplined environment, which made all the difference in the world. You know something? We loved Alex. We really loved Alex. But he knew as well as you know you're sitting in that chair that if he caused an infraction against our rules, he would suffer the consequences like anybody else. And you know what? He liked that. He responded to that quite well. So we're trying to present to you that this love grew out because we cared for Alex. We want him to be a godly young man. And that should be the thing that grips the heart of any parent. I want to begin to deal with these issues now as they crop up and become evident in the child's life, let's deal with it effectively so that they can grow up with the right perspective of life. Now, We just read this verse from Proverbs 3.12. For whom the Lord loves, he reproves, even as a father. Notice carefully the son in whom he delights. Notice that word delight. It's translated in various ways. But the idea of admiration is in the word delight. A parent should delight in his child. I've heard parents say, and sometimes, even in the hearing of their children, I just can't wait till my kids grow up and get out of the house. What a terrible thing to think let alone say, even in the presence of your children. Delight. You admire your child. He is a trust from heaven for which you will be a, a parent will be held accountable of raising him. You admire his gifts, his talents, his abilities, as you see them begin to develop. The potential that's there in that child for good 
are for evil. What a wonderful thing it is when parents can say, you know, Our children are such a joy to us. Our children are such a delight to us. That's that word, delight, in whom the Father delights. And that delight that admiration is connected with discipline. It's, let me put it this way, I love you so much, I'm not going to let you get by with that. Because whatever the misbehavior is, if it's neglected and overlooked or carelessly not dealt with, for whatever reason, you're allowing that disobedience to be like another strand of twine that is binding that child to a life of sin, disbelief, arrogance, and rebellion. And you're letting it grow and develop and become part of the lifestyle of that child if you're not dealing with it. And it very well could be a policeman will deal with it some night in the back alley with a 38 revolver. It's your choice. It's your choice. Do you love that child? Then don't let him get by with those things that are going to grip him more and more in his life and ruin him and destroy him. What's our goal in training a child? When he is old, he will not depart from it. And there'll be plenty of opportunities for him to depart from it. In the 50s, I was attending Bob Jones University. Bob Jones University was criticized and criticized and criticized, but they're too strict. They have too many rules and regulations. They never saw a they never sent a girl home embarrassed. I was there. I know what the rules were. There were a lot of rules. And you know something? I can tell you before the Lord this morning. I was glad for every one of them. I signed up for a course at Bob Jones in Spanish. And because I had taken some courses in Spanish at SMU. But I signed up for this one at Bob Jones. And the first day I went to the class, I thought, I've had this, class. I've had this course before at SMU. So I went to the registrar's office to drop the class, which I did. And in a week, my name shows up on the discipline list. My name's on the discipline <laughs> what, what have I done? So they had a discipline committee. And this particular time, uh, the, the dean of men uh, was handling some of the cases. Uh, there were other faculty. So I, I got him, and I walked up to him, and I told him, 
told him why I was there. He says, your name's on the list. I said, yes. He looked at it. He says, you missed Spanish class three times. I said, sir, I dropped that course. And I said, evidently, the drop slip didn't get to the teacher. He had arthritis and he looked up at me and he said, it was your responsibility to see to it that they did get the drop slip. That'll be 25 demerits. Why would I share this personal experience with you? Because I want to tell you, that's discipline. That's righteous. That is good. That is right. You know what I said to him? Yes, sir. Because if I had said anything else besides yes, sir, to him, he would have said, that'll be 25 more demerits. And rightly so. Do you know why there's discipline like that at the university? Because they feel responsible for you as an individual entrusted to them. I had opportunity to attend SMU. I took a course called Old Testament Survey. The teacher claimed to be a modern Quaker, whatever that is. I heard that man literally make fun of the Bible. He said, there's no truth in the book of Jonah. He said, it's a good missionary track. He said, the book of Ecclesiastes should have been written by, written, he said, it was written by a, a bitter old and dejected preacher who should have retired years ago. On and on, I, it got worse. And I thought to myself, here are some young people coming from ungodly homes, many of them, sitting and hearing a professor make fun of God's word. And that's what eventually can happen. And what happens to the child who's not been raised properly in his home? I thought to myself, as I was sitting in that classroom, I thank God for my parents who loved me, who prayed with me, who shared God's word with me, who took me to church, yes, and who spanked me with a peach tree limb and other things. <laughs> but they got the job done. And you know why? Because they love me. They love me. Now, It's interesting, I don't think that we, I want to, I'm going to go ahead and introduce this. I want to try to develop this subject and we may have to add on to our, our sessions. But I think it's important because it is a very vital part of true biblical discipline. Um, I want us to consider Job. Why would we want to think about Job? Well, because Job fell under the correction of God. And there's some things that we need to learn about that. Turn with me to Job chapter 3 and verse 2. And Job says, even today, 
is my complaint bitter? My stroke is heavier than my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. I would order my cause before him and fill my mouth with arguments. Now, that's the King James Version. Uh, let me read the New American Standard Version. Even today my complaint <clears throat> is rebellion. His hand is heavy despite my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come to his seat. I would present my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. Job was under divine correction. And in the midst of that correction, this is the picture. He felt he needed to talk to God about it. I want you to follow closely here what I'm saying. He said, if I could, I would fill my mouth and here the picture is, we want to get it clear. He's not saying with argumentative discussion. That's not what the words mean. The words mean, but with reasoning and discussion, seeking understanding. That word argument is actually the same Hebrew word for correction. When God corrects his children, he permits, quote, arguments, discussion, reasoning. And when we correct our children, we should allow time for, I'm going to use the word, discussion. Please try to grasp this. Not disagreements, but with reasoning. When God corrects his children, he permits them. Um, look at Job 23. Verse 4, Job 23, verse 4. I would present my case before him and fill my mouth with, would be reasoning, arguments or reasoning. I would learn the words which he would answer and perceive what he would say to me. Would he contend with me by the greatness of his power? No, surely he would pay attention to me. There the up, upright would reason Interestingly enough, the King James says dispute, but a better translation is there he would, there the upright would reason uh, with him, and I would be delivered forever. That word reason, it's the very same Hebrew word that we've been talking about. What is Job saying? Here's what Job is saying. If I could just get an audience with God, I believe I would talk with him. And I believe I would be able to understand what he is going to tell me. Well, that introduces the element of the fact that we need to be reasonable with our children. And it's not, I'm going to make you do this, be, if it's not said, at least implied, you're going to do this because I'm bigger than you are and I'm going to make you do it. You may not say it in those words, but many times that's what's coming across when there's lack of sitting down, especially when you sense 
this child needs to understand what's going on here in terms of discipline. The reason and the goal of what we're after. And we're going to leave it there because our time is up. We'll try to continue this thought uh, in our next series, which will be two weeks because we have communion next Lord's Day. But I hope all of this is presenting to you a picture of the intricacies of true godly discipline being conducted out of a heart of love. That's that's the way I can say it. Let's pray. Father, we need your help and your blessing to understand these words, these truths, and to implement them. Perhaps not in our own life at this point, but to pray for those who uh, will be required to raise their children in a godly home. For your glory, for your honor, that they might know you and serve you. Keep us, Lord, by your grace. We ask in Christ's name. Amen.